Thank you so much for having us, uh, Rene. We're now in your uh, memorabilia room, uh, and we're going to talk to you about uh, your time at, uh, at Manchester United and how things are going today. Uh, we're really looking forward to it. Brilliant, and uh, thanks. You know, I thought it was uh, the best place for uh, for your guys to come here. Uh, easy, relaxed, you know, so uh, let's do it. We have uh, brought this uh, little gift for you. Oh, look at this. Have you... Melk, melk chocolate. <laughs> yeah. That's you like exactly it? how we would say it in, in, yeah. in Holland. Yeah, melk chocolate. So Absolutely. in our podcast, we have this um, chocolate discussion, really. Oh, you do? Yeah. yeah Fetish yeah. about chocolate. <laughs> yeah. Oh, great. Do you have any favorites? Any go-to chocolates? Uh, not really. We, we always have the certain chocolates here that's called Cat, Cadbury's, I think. Yeah. The one with the purple uh, kind of things, but yeah, quite nice. So it's uh, the three of us and your dog. Yeah, yeah it's Max. <laughs> Rene. He obviously wants to join in in the podcast. Hi, huh, Maxi. We're sat here in uh, sunny Wilmslow, and you've been here since 2001 uh, in the same house as well. Yep. Uh, do you feel like a Dutch Mancunian? Do I feel like a Dutch Mancunian? Yeah, it's <laughs> a good question. Yeah, yeah, I think I do. You sound like one. <laughs> well, that's for other people to decide, but they they, they still sometimes say that uh, they, I, I don't know, I just, you know, I, I just speak the way that I speak, but it's other people that sometimes say that I have certain pronunciations that they think, oh, you can hear you, you're a mank. Yeah. Well, so be it, I'm proud mank then. Yeah. Okay, Rene, I'm, uh, I'm sitting here looking at the picture of you and uh, Sir Alex Ferguson. You're now... Um you're, you're soon uh, publishing your, your second book, um, United Sir Alex and Me. We've seen the cover. Uh, can you reveal what's, what's inside? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a book long time in the making. I think I believe that um, I've obviously previously brought out uh, a book, but that was more a real coaching book, you know, for, for coaches. This one is, a, is more of, um, you know, my, my story. The story of the book is, is about is about United. It's about obviously Sir Alex and me working with Sir Alex. Mm. And it's about myself and the journey that I've taken, you know, how I got to United, my time at United and a little bit what's happened after after that. Uh, it, it The reason why, because I've got that request so often and I thought, you know, I need to start thinking about it. And <clears throat> like I said, we worked hard on it for over two years in the making. Uh, Wayne Barton, who's obviously written a lot of uh, United books, uh, has helped me a lot. Although I have to say that predominantly most of the things that I've, you know, when it was done on paper, I've sort of fine-tuned it or re rewritten it. And the aim is basically, um, especially for United fans, I want to give them a really good insight about obviously myself and the journey, how I got to United. But also I want to give them an opportunity to have a peek behind the curtain of success. Why was United so successful in and around that period? I with think Sir Alex? that question is here in the manuscript. Uh, <laughs> it will, it will, it will come. So we will reveal that. But that is that is the thing. I want I want people to to write the book that have a passion for Manchester United to say at the end of the book, well, that was really interesting. Mm. You know, I didn't know that, or I didn't know that. That was that was. Yeah, I can understand now what were the key factors. You know, why United was so successful. That's the stories we, we hope to, to get from you today. Uh, but let's start with the most important question we'll ask you. Uh, how hard did your heart jump when uh, Fielden popped that balloon at Stamford Bridge? It, 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 it ah, Christ. <laughs> I, thought, I still remember it vividly. <laughs> because you could see in the clip, I was so, because there was so, I think the linesman was in front of me because I was constantly changing to looking to see what's happening. And we were sort of going forward in, in, into, uh, you know, into hopefully a good attack. And I had, I was oblivious of what Mick was doing. And he was just obviously saw the balloon, you know, coming towards him and he absolutely smashed it. And it was the loudest bang you can imagine. And honestly, I, I jumped and so did Sir Alex Ferguson. And I said to him, I says, I think we've been shot at. <laughs> I'm not going to repeat what Sir Alex said, but uh, you can see it from the you reaction. It, yeah. But it is, it, every time it's hilarious. And It's a uh, hit on YouTube. Eh? It's a hit on YouTube. Yeah, it, it, it definitely is. And, and the, the, when that happened in that season, it was the same year as we went to Japan for the World Cup. 
and Simon Wells and uh, the video analyst at the time, we were preparing the, the meeting for one of the games. And um, obviously, Sir Alex walked in, you know, because we always discussed, this is, this is what we're going to show. This is what we're going to talk about. Is there anything you need to add or whatever? Mm. So when we finished and I said to him, it says, boss, have you seen the clip where McFeelan pops the balloon? It says, it's ridiculous. We play in Chelsea, such an important game. And he's playing with balloons. No, I haven't seen it. Put it on. So Simon put it on on the big screen. And honestly, Sir Alex was absolutely in stitches. And he said, show it again, show it again, show it again. <laughs> and we were absolutely howling of laughter. Then Mick Feeling walks in. Fucking hell, Mick. You know what I mean? What do you think? So Mick was laughing. Then the players came in and he just kept showing it. It was absolutely brilliant. All the players were in stitches as well, which was a really, really great moment, I thought. It's, it's like simple little things you don't plan. Yeah. But they're so important for team spirit yeah. and team bonding because laughter is, is one of the, the most important ingredients. And, uh, and, and uh, so Alex Ferguson had plenty of that, I can tell you that. So even though he looked angry, he made it to like... Uh, oh, yeah, when yeah. he saw it back, it was, it was just hilarious. Yeah. Fantastic. Fantastic, yeah. It's now 10 years since he retired and, and you <clears throat> also left the club. Me and Frederick, we, we tend to to look back on those memories that we cherish that you have on the wall here. How is it for you to, to look back today on on uh, on how you and Ferguson and Mick ah, uh, and all the success you, it, you achieved together? It fulfills me with just pure joy when when I when I when I think back and when I look back at the pictures and like you said the pictures, you know, it, it tells you more than a thousand words and that picture behind me with me and Sir Alex, I think, is one of the the most beautiful pictures I have with him. And it it sums a lot in that picture. If you look at the picture, there is there is that connection, there is that communication, there is that whatever. And, and a that was nice smile as well. Yeah, but that was like I said, that run that was a running theme mm. through our work, you know. Um it, it it was just fantastic. But it is it is, like I said, pure joy fulfillment satisfaction yes there have been moments where you wish things turned out a little bit better but in hindsight i could have wished i couldn't have wished for anything you know more and you look back and because i've been at united obviously for a long long time since since 2001 so these were the sort of last six years but you don't and we just have no inkling we just carried on year after year it was you know it was just a train that just carried on and we stopped at the station and we looked at the trophies we won and off to the next one and load up with, with, with more trophies and that's mm. how we looked at it. If it then comes to an end, then suddenly you think, oh, you know, but these memories tell the stories and I think that the book, like I said, hopefully will, it will because it's it's a nice way for me sort of to put my feelings and, 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 and things and ideas on, on a piece of paper and mm. have something to look back on. It was obviously a lot of staff members, but uh, but let's talk about uh, Mike Phelan, you and Sir Alex Ferguson. Can you, can you give us some insight into what kind of roles you had? How did you share on the the different um, roles? It was very very helpful when eventually Sir Alex Ferguson made the decision to promote Mick to assistant manager and me to first team coach. Was that he called me in his office uh, one day, and he said, obviously. Obviously, Rene, you know, um, Mick's going to be assistant manager. And obviously, part of his role was also to look a little bit more after all those players when we had international duties. You know, where did they go? When they were coming back? And commercial stuff, something I didn't have to do and to bother about, which was great. I said, I just want you to concentrate on the sessions. I don't have to tell you how to run a session. That's all brilliant. But he said, if I close my eyes and I see the best Man United in, in front of my eyes, this is what I see. And he had a flip chart written down a lot of stuff. And he said, uh, you know, from a defensive point of view, I want to make sure that we, we are able to press really high aggressively when we want to do that. On other times, I want us to drop a little bit deeper in a block and then press a certain area or a certain player. And then we can hit the spaces that we, that we leave. If we have to sometimes press really deep or press defend really deep from a block to defend, making sure we limit giving chances away, blah, 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 et cetera, et cetera, because clean sheets are very important to me. But then when in turnovers, can we then counter and break? And then obviously everything is done on, on a quick transition. Obviously looking after set pieces. Next page. 
in possession, he says, and that's an important part of the game, is that all the good teams, all the good teams have rhythm. They create rhythm and they maintain that sort of rhythm or they change that rhythm. So in build-up, you have a different rhythm in trying to get and then, you know, go forward. And within that possession, I want players to understand always think forward, look forward, play forward. He he absolutely hated it when players played the ball back and he could have gone forward or square. Old you know Trafford I mean? as well. Huh? Oh, at Old Trafford oh, as well. Oh, he hated yeah. it. He absolutely hated it. So there was an element that, you know, I wanted to get the players subconsciously to think about it. There's a lot of sub- subconscious training going on in think forward, look forward, play forward. Mm-hmm. So if you already got that in your mind, your first solution is to go forward. And if you go forward, you normally most of the time hurt the opposition so that was important and it says when we get into when we break in lines or we get into behind the thing it's about that we can in condensed areas we can switch to one touch football one touch and movement you know we go, you know up back through you know bang 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 pfft, run us you know what i mean wide areas can we create one v ones we've got players with a lot of individual skills can we create on the laps overlaps all, all uh, opportunities to, to go and attack. And then the last page, which was the most important one, he said, this is when I see Man United attack. And he says, when I see them attack, I see them attack with pace, power, penetration, and unpredictability. And he says, I want those things that I just showed you from a defensive point, possession, and the attacking side, I want you to instill that in this group every training. Whatever you do. So those were the key elements. So basically written down on three flip charts. And the best thing was of all was uh, when he said that line about pace, uh, power, penetration, unpredictability, he put a line and he said, if that doesn't work, we gamble. (laughs) And I absolutely love that. So that's where Fergie time comes in. And that's where we go, okay, now let's see what we can do, you know, from the last minute to the game. But for me, that was so helpful. Because now I knew, right, these are the ingredients. So whether we did a finishing session, all those things were in it. Pace, penetration, you know what I mean? I always set it up that those elements were in it. Condition, possession game, condition games, wave games, all that. And if you look back to the games and the best games we played, that comes to my mind. You know, if you see them go, look at the Arsenal games when Rooney and Park and Ronaldo and all flying forward. That was directly from that, came directly from the training ground. Because I did a lot of these wave games, you know, put mannequins in the middle of the park, you pick the ball up at the edge of the box, and then you had to to find your way to the next goal as quick as you could. Hmm. You know what I mean? Now it's that, been an incredible feeling when you see you work, ah, working on the training round in the fant- games. Fantastic. Yeah. Brilliant. I just, that, there's, there's so many moments, but yeah. So <clears throat> yeah, I, I I've always and and I have to say when when I was working with those players. It it had, it acquired a different approach because they were so, uh, first of all, talented. Yeah, there was a lot of experience in that group. So, and I've I've learned from observing before that I felt this group is not a stop stand still group. You know what I mean? They they always want uh, maintaining a certain pace. Mm. So if you constantly got to stop, you know what I mean? <sighs> yeah. You know what I mean? So I didn't do that at all. So if we picked the conditioning game for eight minutes, we were playing for eight minutes. If I wanted to make a few points, then I was in between. During the breaks. Yeah. During the breaks, yeah. whether it was individually or, or in general, but it was in the breaks. So the players knew when we play for eight minutes, we play for eight minutes. And uh, they, really, they, really, they really valued it. Plus the fact that the players were of such a high standard and such a high understanding of the game that... What you then, it's its not like called delegation to the players, but it's empowering the players. You know what I mean? You say, mm. listen, these are the best options. You know, whether you can, you, can, you, can, you, can, you can play through, you can play over the top, but you guys have to recognize what is best in what given situation. Now, you don't, I don't have to explain Gigsy, you know, what decision to make or Paul Scholes or Micah Carrick. They're outstanding. Mm. Outstanding. You know, same with Rio and, and, and Vida. You know, when do we step through? You know, when we step back, you know what I mean? With making sure that you maintain the distances constantly, you know, because if you step and they don't, you're creating a gap. These, you know. They knew. I, they knew, of course they knew. And and if they didn't do it, you in a little break, hey, hold on a minute. Mm. And if there was a, a, a particular trend, because that's another thing, you know, 
you always have you work towards a new game and all that but we hardly if i can remember we hardly ever did any any pre uh, reviews about you know to the players about a game what i used to do because the manager says no we're moving on you know mm. what i mean but if there was a trend that started to exist like oh we, we starting to concede you know um six goals in the last eight games on the on on, on our left side oh what, what's the problem here mm. you know what i mean mm. then i would probably pick up the players that i would think they are involved show them and say listen what do you think the problem is I, I think what I know the problem is, but I'd rather have you guys because mm. if you know what the problem is, you can solve it yourself and mm. you guys are playing, which which they did, you know, a lot of times. Bam, saw it, no problem. That was never done in a, in a team setting. No. Ferguson wasn't even there. I would say to him, listen, boss, I've highlighted this because I think that's a bit of an issue. I discussed it. Yeah, fine. Should not be a problem anymore. Yeah, it was it was just uh, it was just a delight to work with and, and, and the environment was obviously unique. Yeah, because one thing is the the winning culture that that came with Ferguson. But you spoke about uh, the the relationship between uh, the two of you and Mick, but also in the in the in the group of players, um, Rio Ferdinand has this video diary from one of the tours that's on that's on YouTube today, and it's amazing to see how that group just gelled together, yeah. and that's perhaps what we as fans like miss as have been missing the last 10 years like where's the united culture where's the camaraderie where was there a secret behind that that uh, you as as the staff uh, worked on this or, or was was it just an a unique group no of I, i think it was it was i think it was just a, a natural outcome from <clears throat> from Ferguson, you you mentioned the most important word for any football team: culture. Uh, if you've got the wrong culture, you you have no chance on success. So with culture comes identity, mm. and how do you create that identity? You know what what do you want players to think when they talk about Manchester United? Now in the Ferguson era, I think that was very clear. You know what I mean? Words like winning, uh, attractive football, uh, Fergie time, uh, goals, all those things come to your mind. But also what it is in general, Ferguson came in this club and I came at the back end of it. He came in in, in, in 86, you know, and, and then 20 years later, I joined him. So you've already built two successful teams. Took a while for him, obviously, that every you know, before he got going, but when he got going, it never stopped. But within that culture, that identity, it was all about, was all about winning. It was all about uh, being competitive. It was all about respect. It was all about communication. You know, all those things. And then when we started winning, <clears throat> then obviously expectations changed. You know, the ambitions changed. Mm. Yeah? So now it was, now we've won the league once. No, 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 no. You know what I mean? And then it comes back to, if you think about it, what a bold statement that he made by saying, I want to knock Liverpool off the perch. Yeah. And he think about it. Well, you know, that was like, oh my, hold that's, on a minute. That's you a have, crazy thing to say. You have, mm. to, you have to win so many, t you know mm. what I mean? Yeah. But by doing that, by, 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 by putting a theme to it, that is like an undercurrent drive. So with that ambitions comes expectations. With expectations comes responsibilities. <laughs> yeah? And with responsibilities, or for, sorry, with uh, expectations comes standards. And with standards comes responsibilities. And that's, I think, was... The real culture in that order you know we've got the highest of the highest ambitions therefore we have the highest of highest expectations to meet those expectations we've got the highest of highest standards yeah and because to meet those standards we have to take our responsibilities as staff as players as managers etc yeah. <clears throat> and that was thing so back to the culture thing that was the identity and that was also part of every player that came to united came for one reason only to win They knew we were going to win. Mm. So they bought into this immediately. 100%. You have to, yeah. But were there also players that you had to work with on a daily basis to try to get them into this culture? And if Well, not everybody is the same. Not everybody is the same, but I think it's very simple. Frederick, the ones that were or, or needed a bit more attention or were just not up to scratch, they wouldn't survive. No. They just move on. How long time did they get before they were? Oh, they were asked. Yeah, again, different, different to say. Some, some, some have had a little bit more chance than others. But um, 
But did you see it soon and started working with it immediately, or did they just no do their own? No, way? but you can you 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 know what the standards that the real top players put in there, and that is very 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 high, and you can see very very quickly if somebody can yeah yeah make that switch to it or not. And then if you're constantly on the knee, because the, the key is that you can only start 11 players, you know, and then at that time you can only make three substitutions, but yeah. the substitutions can never be a reason where the quality drops, mm. not not for the teams like Manchester United. But coming back to all that, what I just said is one of the key, most vital things is laughing, enjoyment. What, what the manager you know put in this in in this club and and the fun hmm. that's what we always want apart from training well and doing well there was a lot of fun you know a lot of laughter going on but training was never a joke you know what I mean it was all all you know fantastic and uh, like I said so Alex Ferguson you know it, there's a saying in Holland you know one day not laughed is one day not lived but he, he definitely lived by that by that mm. motto. So Sir Alex had this in him, this oh. humor. Oh yeah. yeah? Oh, Can yeah. you give us an example yeah. of uh, what kind of humor? Yeah. He had? yeah. What kind of humor? yeah? Well, the, the, the first meeting between the two of you, I've heard he he uh, he uh, said he, he didn't like the people from from Holland. No, 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 no. He said that was that was funny because it was again an amazing experience to to go into Carrington for the starters and like I said like everybody does the first one you meet is Kath at the reception yeah. she must be 210 I think by now but she's still going she loves the milk chocolates by the way yeah I bet and she's lovely she is so nice and she was so welcoming and but my first experience to walk into Alex's office when when and he had his, his his training gear on and his shorts and his slippers you know and uh, and the, the 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 European trophy was there, you know, the Champions League trophy. And I thought, Jesus. Anyway, so we had this chat, but on the last day, so I stayed for five days, and on the last day, so we had this chat and how it was, and so Alex was really upbeat and really positive. He says, there's only one thing I don't really like about you Dutch. You, you speak better English than me. <laughs> and he said, uh, I bet you, I says, half the players, they don't understand me what I'm saying. And I said, that's probably why you're so successful. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, scandalous. Get out. <laughs> but that's that's the sort of stuff he was he was like if you would be in a canteen and you just happened to stand next to him making a cup of tea, you know, I bet you a hundred percent he would just go with his little spoon in the in the cup mm. and then put it on top of your hand, you know what I mean? And, bah, you know, like that. He would do things like that or Put a lot of you know, like with a lot of people, when people go and have a bowl of soup, and put a lot of salt in there, you know. Mm. <laughs> There's plenty of examples, but he he loved to laugh. He absolutely loved, it. and that relaxed everybody. Yeah, I always say, uh, you know, and that is the amazing thing for me. My time at Manchester United, like I told, I spoke about the ambitions and the expectations, and they are the highest. With that comes pressure. I never felt any of that pressure, and I don't think the players did as such. And that is an amazing thing that yeah. you want to achieve the highest, mm. but there's no pressure. There's just this total commitment and desire. Because as soon as there comes pressure and it's the wrong one, fear kicks in. Mm. You know what I mean? And we, we never had that. That's probably been a problem for the last years. Yeah, you? but obviously that's a different story because yeah. United, obviously, like I said, when Sir Alex Ferguson's left, when, when what he had with that culture, that identity, there's two main components. Continuity and stability. Yeah, continuity has to do with the vision that you have. And so Alex Ferguson has a clear vision when he came into the club, how he wanted to build the club, how he wanted to build the teams, etc., etc., etc. That evolves, but there's a continuity in there. And within that continuity, there is the vision about, like I described, how we want United to play. Like, say, it's like pace, power, penetration, you know, and all that. <clears throat> That's there. The stability is so Alex Ferguson, been there for a long, long time. And the staff that's with him. Yes, he's had a few different assistant managers. Mm. Yeah, with Brian Kidd and um, Jamie Ryan. Uh, Carlos Quiros, obviously Mick, you know, uh, uh, Steve McLaren, mm. you know, etc. So that has changed. But a lot, a lot of people underneath there, they, they were there, you know, with him for 10, 15, 20 years. Mm. 
So those are the two things. The moment that Sir Alex Ferguson left. Here comes Max. And then the, <laughs> hi Maxi. And then the, and the changes took place. That meant one, one, of, the, one of the things is going to go. Mm. Because people, different people come with a different vision. So the continuity goes. Mm. Different people bring in different people. Stability goes. And then it takes the time to get that back. Yeah. And that is all based on performances and results. And if they don't come, mm. then mm. people start to ask questions. And now there's a Dutch uh, manager at Old Trafford trying to build a new culture. Um, first of all, can you teach us the right pronunciation? Erik ten Hag. Okay, we'll okay. have you to practice that. <laughs> no, but you should in Norway. You should be able to pronounce it easy. Erik ten Hag. Yeah. One more time. Erik. Erik ten Hag. Ten Hag. Yeah. Was that good? Ten Hag. That's it. Okay. Here they would say Eric Ten Hag, you yeah, know, yeah. but it's Eric Ten Hag. Can you also tell us how we pronounce your uh, last name? René Mullenstein. René Mullenstein. Yeah. Was that good? Yeah. 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 Do you Very work good. with the R's? But listen, yeah. I tell you something. One of the biggest <coughs> uh, fun that uh, Sir Alec Ferguson ever had with me was when we were on, on pre-season in America, in uh, Seattle. And we were using the, uh, the, the American football team in Seattle's uh, facilities. And they were... Huge, I mean, fantastic, and they had dressing rooms and all that. And every uh, uh, place where you sat had the name, you know, so Alec Ferguson, uh, McFeelin, and all that. And every time my locker, my name was spelled wrong, <laughs> every time. <laughs> so it was Rene Mullenstein with just the U, yeah. yeah? And, for, and I said to the boss, "Look at this here. <laughs> I've been here now for what four or five years, and he can't even spell my name." Now, I didn't know that. Next day, I'm going there. Oh, bloody hell. Mullenstein with EI. And Ferguson laughing. But apparently, he stole the guy that did the <laughs> no, board. No, Changed it every day. So every day that we trained, my, my name. So every time I ripped it off, you know what I mean? But uh, yeah, so like I said, a lot of times my name is uh, it's not pronounced, pronounced right. It's, it's pronounced right in the language that it's in. You spoke about pace, power, penetration, and unpredictability. Is mm -hmm. that correct? Yeah. yeah. Um, can you see some of that now at Old Trafford with Ten Hag as uh, as a when, United when, manager? Yeah. Mm. Yes, when they, and that is definitely they, those are definitely the same ingredients that he has very high uh, on his list. I'm sure, and especially if you look at the teams that he that he that he worked for with Ajax and when they were doing great in the Dutch league and the Champions League. You saw the same things, and 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 when they are turning it on, you know, with Ericsson, with Bruno Fernandes, with Rashford, mm. with with all those players, you see the same things. There's just this vulnerability still. I feel, you know, sometimes sometimes at the back that they, we we always felt like we put it this way when we had performances. Ferguson was always very sharp on that we would never drop under a certain line. You know, whoop, you know what I mean? You could you could drop, mm. but then, okay, let's get a draw or let's get a 1-0 win. Just drag it over the line. doesn't matter. He always he always emphasized how important 1-0 wins were. They're going to win you the championship. You know what I mean? Yep. Uh, and that is, I think, the problem if you look at this season now for, for Eric, it is that too often they've dropped too far. You would never go to Anfield and lose 7-0. Huh? You would never go to Anfield. And no, that you know. Well, it's unthinkable. But listen, I can't say too much because we lost six-one to City at home, <laughs> which was which was a, which was a crazy game, and that eventually cost us the league. Mm. If you think about yeah. it, and yeah. and that was a free game because there was there was nothing in that game. I think it was what was it at half time? Do you guys remember one 0 or two 0 Something, Something like, like that. that. Yeah. But but straight after half time, Johnny Evans got sent off. Yeah. You know, and then they scored three 0 because if you look at them, they, they won six one. They probably only had seven shots at target, but every single one went in. Mm. But then we score three one with ten men. There goes Old Trafford. That's typical Old Trafford. Hey, hey no problem. We can do it with ten mm. men. Keep going. And that was the problem where we we were a little bit too cavalier at that day, and we went forward in, in numbers at times. And and every time they broke, they hurt us. It went in. That was the problem. If we would have probably got back to three two. Then who knows? Yeah. You know what I mean. But we should have basically, 
you know, uh, uh, you know, counted our losses at that time and just said keep it, keep it to three one and 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 you know whatever, but don't don't go further. And mm. he highlighted that after the game. He says, I I tell you every season how important goal difference is, how important it is to score a lot of goals if you can. But at the same time, I also highlight how important clean sheets are mm. or not conceding goals. And unfortunately, this time round, yeah, it signalled the uh, you know the first was it the first. Premier League win for City, I think, with that one one goal difference. Uh, might have been. That don't, we don't count them. <laughs> yeah. No, we do. Don't. Uh, but but that, that that was yeah, that was it. But do but you believe in Ten Hag's uh, sorry um, philosophy and, and vision? And do you believe he can actually bring the Premier League title back to Old Trafford? Well, that's a bit. That's two different things. Yeah. <laughs> because the, the, the first one, one yes. Yeah. I do think he's a, he's a, he's a very good coach. Uh, he wants to play the right way. I'm sure that his DNA and the way that he wants to play is very similar what United want you know to stand for. So there's absolutely no problem there. The second one is is a different question because that has to do not only with Ten Hag. Mm. That has to do with obviously, you know, the top players and the players keeping performing. What can he add to solidify that that team that it doesn't go you know to thing because the one thing is and and with with Eric is when these things is you know don't panic about it you know he, he, I think he's he's he manages himself well he manages himself well in the media he doesn't overcomplicate things he's in that respect typical Dutch as we are we say it as it is you know we're not going to go and manufacture some story but we just bang we just say it as it is and he does that he does that the same what he just needs to be really uh, sharp on is that every game win, or lo- win draw or loss it's just information that's what you get losing 7-0 from, from uh, at Anfield is information because look at the first half we should have been 2-0 up mm. yeah we don't take the chances there you are second half for whatever reason we don't turn up you give them an enormous boost because they were in a difficult situation and suddenly everything that goes our way goes in, flies in. Might happen, but that might never happen. In It's information. So what do you do with that information? That has the, that's what he needs to gather because that is going to be his blueprint for moving on. You know what I mean? For mm. moving on to the next to the next season because he needs to get it right. Because mm. at the end of the day, for me, Manchester United should always there be the last few games in the game Competing for the Premier League title. Mm. That's what United should be. Nothing else. Other, other than that, it's not, a, it's not a good season unless you are going for the Champions League and maybe winning it. Obviously, uh, there's a lot to talk about how Manchester United will uh, get better and uh, regarding the summer, the summer market. What kind of players do you think Ten Hag needs next season to, to raise the levels even further? Um... I think they need to. They need to be, be getting very clear about. Obviously, I think uh, the goalkeeper situation is is one he needs to start address. Not only because I really f- like uh, David de Gea. I've obviously worked with him himself. A lot of experience, done fantastically well. People are are judging him sometimes because, like I said, the mistakes that he's made in this season in certain games are so much unlike him. But you have to ask the question: Why, why is that? And that could be because sometimes, you know, you can get a bit stale. You know what I mean? Sometimes you need to, you know, um, have a new environment or, you know, to make it sure freshen things up. But I think, you know, that is a, that's an area we need to look at with somebody that is obviously had the capabilities to handle the Premier League and is capable, very good with his feet because that becomes more and more important. Mm. I still think the back line needs to be addressed, although it's very clear that he fancies Lacina Martinez, which obviously... You know, which is good because he's been a fantastic defender so far. He's a winner. He's a competitor uh, in the left-hand position. Um, he's got a few options there. With obviously, he's got Luke Shaw there on the right-hand side. He's played a lot of Varane, but he's obviously older, getting on, experienced, mm. uh, serial winner. Knows what it is. It's important in that respect that Varane and Casemiro. Those are the two players that bring that ingredient into the club. What we used to have, yeah, it was normal for us winning. That's that's for them. But again, very injury prone, mm. you know. So I would, I would, 
I would also look maybe for another one. I do. I don't think, um, you know, Harry is the, is the answer. And I think if I would be Harry, I would I would myself look 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 for somewhere else. Mm -hmm. The right hand side <clears throat> with uh, Aaron Wan-Bissaka or Dalo, two different, complete two different right backs. One gives far more going forward. The other one is very good at defending. But at the, this moment in, in, in time, you need and and players that can do that. Frimpong is being mentioned. Who? Frimpong. Yeah, from Leverkusen, mm. Dutch boy. Uh, is he any good? He's a good player. He's a good player, but playing for Manchester United, I know I don't know him well enough to to make a, a direct assessment to say, yeah, he, he would fit perfectly well. I would, I would see more of him because... The key with elder players to come into Manchester United is, is that they have to produce that quality. I always used to say to Sir Alex, I say, if we look at players, the thing is this, so you look at two ways to players looking at players, is being and becoming. And what I mean by that is, if you bring being, you bring Varane and Casimiro and Eriksen, they've been there, no problem. You put them in and they will perform, like we did with Van Persie. But the structure around that particular time with Sir Alex Ferguson and, and the Glazer family was, We, we, we tend not to do that. We were bringing in players 23 or younger, you know, to them. That's becoming. Mm. So they are already being in terms of they're good enough to play, but there's more to come. Yeah, You know what I mean? So those are the players like Anthony, like uh, Sancho. And there have to be a mix there. Yeah, there has to be a mix. But at the end of the day, have they got the quality to make a difference? Week in, week out. That's the, that's the key. That's the biggest challenge for all the players to come unite you know, cannot just turn up one game yeah brilliant you get all the plaudits and don't turn up the next that was I felt the strongest asset aspect of the team that we've worked with was that stability that continuity the consistency to to constantly hit that high hmm. those high levels so we didn't get carried away with a win against Arsenal or Liverpool great no five, three points in the box next yeah. no problem next and the same thing with Champions League Because the traveling and all that, how we dealt with that, you know, and 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 and, and the way that we we managed all that and managed the managed the group, but there was just this constant focus, and again, not get carried away, and um, that was to me a little bit. I'm just saying a little bit fantastic that United won the Carabao Cup because that's what every manager wants. Mm. It solidifies, uh, it helps them getting the messages across. Da 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 da. And you, you have to be happy and you have to celebrate it. But I would have not celebrated over the top because I would have just said, great, very happy with it, very pleased for the players, but got a long way to go. Yeah. Mm. Don't celebrate it like you won the Champions League. And that, I think, was a little bit the case. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. you know, and United cannot be happy just winning the Carabao Cup, in my respect. So we got one big chance to go against Man City. So which will be... Uh, A fantastic, a fantastic game to look forward to. But those are the games where you really see the measure of where we are. Um, so going back to the team, a really good midfield player. Because obviously I, th I still think, yes, you got Casimiro in there. You got um, Ericsson in there, Bruno Fernandes. A lot of experience, a lot of qualities. But there's also a little bit of a vulnerability. Because all the mindsets are predominantly in going forward. Mm -hmm. Last, some... last year they were looking at De Jong. This year, uh, Gravenberg is is being nah, mentioned. Nah, I would 100 do everything to get De Jong. Yeah, yeah, because he's got energy, he's got legs. You know, he's he's tactically very very good mm. uh, in the build-up. Do you build think up. Ten Hag can convince him to to come this summer? I, I I you know for De Jong, I think to be fairly honest, if. He would have already been here, I think, if he would have not been happy at Barcelona. What has happened was outside basically his, you know, sometimes things happen for political or financial reasons, not to do with you as a player. But he's obviously very happy playing for Barcelona because, mm. you know, that's otherwise he would have he would have said, OK, no problem, sort me out. Mm. Uh, because there's always a way to 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 fill that financial gap. You know, what I mean, that can never be the reason. But I can see why, why he's why he's chasing him. Yeah, up front, you know, at the end of the day, I think we've got plenty of plenty of opportunities and and possibilities in the wide areas. It's a re running debate in the podcast: Harry Kane or Victor Osman. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, the thing is this: 
with, with them two, if you look at them, them two players, I think Harry Kane is, is 100% guarantee you 25 goals or plus. Knows is the Premier too League. Late? No, it's not too late. No. How old is Harry? 29. Yeah, 30. he would give you. St- he would still give you four or five really good years. You think so? Yeah, hundred percent. He's fit. He's a fit boy, and and like I said, United would create more chances than than, than Tottenham do. But he's I'd, happy now. He yeah. wants Harry Kane. That's my preferred choice. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, Osimhen is is still again good prospect, younger. You know what I mean? Um, you you need to you need to keep an eye on him as well. But different Italian, different league. He's yeah. not a proven a, a proven player in the Premier League. You know, so in other words, I, I would always take then, especially because United. They're still fighting to get back there, you know what I mean. And mm. and one one player it might sound strange, can make a heck of a difference. You know, if you suddenly have somebody there, you know that, and he he can still drop off, you know, the front line. You can yeah. players running off him, no problem at all. You know what I mean? Because he's good in link up play as well. It it really annoys me a little bit because when Son just came to Tottenham so many years ago, and he's there been how long now? Many years. He's, he's uh, seven, eight years. Seven, eight, yeah. Maybe. yeah. Mm. I felt after when I saw him one or two seasons, I thought this this is the player that United need to buy. Mm. Did you I, recommend him to the? Well, I've mentioned club? it. I've, I've mentioned it. I I've, even the other one that I recommended as well. That was obviously you know the story you know um, that I obviously when I left United I went to uh, to Anzi in in Russia with Goose Hiddink, and then Goose left and I took over. But I had a. A really interesting squad with a lot of interesting individuals. Eto'o, Diara, Samba was there. Uh, William. Now, William, that's the player because um, I actually rang uh, David because they were looking for players and I knew William was a mad, mad United fan. Because oh. he asked me, he says, can you help me? And, you know, da, 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 da. Oh. And I said, I can make the call, no problem at all. And I said to him, I says, listen, Dave, we've got somebody here, Brazilian, can versatile, can play any position up front in the midfield, advanced midfield, commercially, you know, a very mm-hmm. good deal as well, but never never injured. Great great kit, you know. And uh, then Ryan rang me, Ryan Giggs, after, just to follow it up. And I said, Ryan, if there's anybody that you should know that knows what United needs, then it's me, because I've worked with you guys, you know, for so many years. He said, believe me. It'll be great. Anyway, it never materialized because then Tottenham came in and then the the the, the relationship between and the Anzi owner, Kerimov and Abrimovic, they sort of hijacked and Abrimovic now and I said, bring him to me. Yeah. And then at the last day, because I think he was in, in, in Spurs to do the, the medicals, oh. and at the same day, boom, he went off to uh, to Chelsea. So that mm-hmm. was a little bit of a, a one-two between them two. And look at him, and William has been outstanding for... Mm-hmm. Uh, for Chelsea, and he still is. For Fulham. Yeah, for Fulham, fantastic. Yeah. I love to see him play. I love absolutely brilliant. Drives with the ball. He's positive. You know, he's great. And that's a shame. You know, you think to yourself, those players could have, they could have definitely made a made a difference. Going back to to Harry Kane, you mentioned uh, Robin van Persie yourself. Yeah. Just do you think that uh, Harry Kane can have the same impact? Uh, yeah. On United as Robin. Yeah. Did? Yeah. It's without a doubt, Harry is a top top professional. Prove that year in year out, even this year in a in a difficult situation with Tottenham, <clears throat> he's the most remarkable team in, in 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 the Premier League this year because they kept losing every week and he still stayed in fifth. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> they never dropped the players apart from the last few weeks. But having said that, listening to Harry in one of his interviews, I'm not sure whether that's going to happen. But talking about you know that uh, he need to raise the standards and mm. need to connect with the fans and. Mm. He has a big choice to make for his own career. Yeah. It is whether to say, listen, I want to become Mr. You know, Mr. Tottenham Hotspur and I'm going to spend the rest of my career here and fingers crossed a manager comes in that, that could propel us to winning, mm. you know, maybe an FA Cup or mm. doing something. Mm-hmm. Or he's going to say, listen, I've got another really high quality years ahead of me, five years. I definitely want to go to a club where I've got a chance, you know, to, to challenge for the, for, the, for the Premier League or... Uh, or maybe another trophy. What so was bit... what was your role in the Van Persie signing? Nothing else than uh, because I knew I knew which agency he was with, and that they contacted me one day and said, "Listen, Rene, uh, 
just between, like I say, off the record, I know Robin is not going to re-sign for Arsenal. He loves to stay in the Premier League. He's made it clear to us that he, he would love to play for Man United, but especially for Sir Alex Ferguson. Mm. Um, you know, what do you think? Could you sound it out? So I just ran it I just ran it by Sir Alex and I told him exactly what I just told you. And he says, you know, a little bit, you know, not sure about it because obviously, again, you know, Arsenal, injury record, all the player, blah, blah, blah. Mm. And I says, listen, just, you know, don't need an answer now. We don't know how genuine it is. You know what I mean? Sometimes players do it, you know, to, to, to get the profile out there, to get a better deal or to go to another club. So we don't want that. Forget that. It says, I can find out how genuine it is because if, if, if it isn't, then we stop it there. Simple. You have to check with what David Gill thinks. And so they had those discussions. I checked his injury record, which was all gone. It was fine because he played all the games, you know, and, was very important for Arsenal. A lot of goals, a lot of assists. And, um, yeah, I tried to find out as much as I could. And it was he was very honest and he was very sincere. And that is what I got back to to, to Sir Alex. And uh, eventually they started to look into it. I have did a little bit of a trick, um, you know, with some of the senior players at United, like Ferdinand, I would say, listen, if you can pick, you know, him and him and him and him, mm. you know, for next year, who would you pick? And I did it with a few players, and 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 Robin came out on top. You know what I mean? So that was that was reassuring from our point of view to say, listen, if he walks through the door, then other senior players go away. Yeah, bloody hell, we yeah. got a, we got another trump card here. Mm. And you, you know, I I also there was no doubt in my mind that that was not going to work because of you know. Mm. Um, you know, obviously when that all started to come, I had obviously conversations with him, you know. Um, and when I saw him in pre-season and I had a chat with him and how is it? And he said, ah, oh, it's chalk and cheese. He says, sessions here, like I said, but far more intense and far more, you know, on top of it. And obviously he, he because at Arsenal, Wenger did still everything or mm -hmm. most of it for the training. And he, it, it, you know, I did it. It's not so Alex, he's just, you know, he's just, observes and watches and, and talks to players. He says, no, I love it. He's great. And uh, he hit the ground running. If you look at his, his, his first season, it was absolutely remarkable. Talking about, you know, straight from the training ground and, and, and proud moments, that goal he scored that won as the league against Aston Villa, yep. yeah. that was straight from the training ground. No way. Really? I'm telling you, and I, I explain you how we did it. Uh, that was after the session, and I had uh, Rafa and Fabio mm -hmm. da Silva, I had Wayne and Scolzi, and I had Van Persie and Chicharito up front with four four mannequins at the back. So left back, right back, you know what I mean? Yeah. And two. And one of the centre backs was Vlaar, Ron Vlaar, the Dutch boy, yeah. international. Mm -hmm. And we know him really well. And Robin knew him really well. And we knew that we needed to create moments when there was spacing behind because yeah. he didn't like, you know, balls, over, yeah. balls over the top. Mm -hmm. So the exercise, what it was, was this. Let's say uh, somebody was here to feed the ball to the right back. <clears throat> Then this this midfielder would let's say go away, that this midfielder would rotate under. So at the moment that happened, they would switch over as well, and this player then would look to him, ball over the top. Now go back to this moment in the mm. game. Rooney got the ball, yep. over the top to Van Persie, and then to hit it on that volley. I mean, you know, it was just like, you just yeah, yeah. Yeah. Just grab that feeling no. when you when it's textbook from the training ground. Ah, it's amazing. But then for Robin, it was so. It's the same with it with uh, with his shirt. You know, uh, uh, twenty was it? Yeah, yeah, twenty. And uh, th that was the same thing just before the season. And, and so Alex was asking Robin, "We've got two shirts left, basically twenty or twenty-one, um, because we need to put the list in." For uh, I said, "Well, that's easy." It's going to be 20 because mm. you're here for the 20th title. So you carry it on your back all here so you know what you're playing for, yeah. like a joke. And that's how he picked up. He picked up number 20. And uh, yeah, and although he's he's only won one Premier League title, but I tell you what, he's made a massive impact, yeah. you know, for us winning it. We're, we're running out of time, uh, Rene. Uh, even Max is exhausted. <laughs> <laughs> Max is flattened out. <laughs> one question each, Frederick, before we... Uh, you can start. Yeah. Uh, this is a two-parter, René. Uh, 
could you tell how you worked with with Ronaldo on the on the training pitch before that 42 goal season? And the second part, how would you work with a player like Anthony to fulfill his potential mm. at Old Trafford? Um, well, to start with it, there's two things that triggers every, every performance is is um, um, is obviously your mind. And um, a long, long time ago, I, I, I picked up this line where the mind goes, the rest will follow. And there's so much truth in it because if 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 you your mind is in the right mindset it it triggers and it directs everything else and in both situations also with Cristiano it was sort of on and off the pitch it was that where the mind goes the rest will follow scenario but also i wanted to to maximize his productivity within mm. within uh, in the box basically because what i felt with cristiano was that um, he always wanted to score the perfect goal mm. you know the one in top corner the world is yeah, the one he scored like uh, the free kick against Portsmouth or the one in, in Porto. You know what I mean? Yeah. You will always score one or two of them. But the key was I wanted to get him across quantity. So you need a diversity in goal scoring. So the first thing that I did with him was um, off the training pitch was um, basically show him, sitting him down and I showed him a lot of goals scored by uh, uh, Cole, York, Solskjaer, Van Nistelrooy. You know, and just, you know, it was like a three-minute video and it was bang, 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 bang. And I asked him, he says, tell me what you see. Because it's important that you you see it, not me. You know, I can tell you what you see. Mm. And the first thing he, I don't know what you mean. I says, we're going to look at it again and ask you the question again and then tell me what you see. So he looked at more and then he looked at it more analytical and he came up with exactly the right things. Most of the goals were scored inside the box. Most of the goals scored was one or two touch, mm. and there was a variety in goals, headers, volleys, tap-ins, whatever. And I said, these are the three things that we're going to work on on the pitch. Now, to do that, to, to, to get him more focused and bring him from awareness to understanding, so I'm aware I'm in the box, but do I understand the best options to score? And that process goes in a split second with players, with top strikers. Because they, they calculate very quickly, the ball is coming in, you know, in a split second, it's going to be a one-touch header, boom, in that corner. I mean, that sort of thing. So the more you are aware and the better you understand, the quicker the process goes. So therefore, the execution and probably, and the goals are better. Mm. Focus also, focus on the execution, not on the outcome. That's how a lot of chances are missed. Yeah? You know where you're going to put it. So what I did, if you have a goal and a, and a box, I put, let's say this is the goal, I put two lines from the goalpost all the way to the end. <clears throat> and that's what I call zone one. So the goalkeeper's here. It's the best best chance to score if you win here because you got all the corners high and low to finish. Mm. The goal was there. Then I put two lines from this end to the edge of the box and there's the edge of the box. So that see it was, let's say, the left two zone, right two zone. This is the zones where the most goals are scored from because this is where a lot of players end up. You know, let's say Anthony coming in with his mm -hmm. left foot, boom. Yeah, or you come in this side. It's also, you need to understand that if there's a defender there, better to dribble and beat them on the inside, closer to zone one, because it will increase your chances. So obviously the lines with the back line is zone three, is the hardest. So in this zone, you look more for crosses or cutbacks. Yeah, so these are the most important scoring zones. One and left and right two. So... What I did then when I was working with him, I had this lined up with mannequins, with flat markers. Mm. And then every time I worked with him, we picked, let's say, uh, in the sessions I did with him when, when he was suspended, so we did a lot of time, I picked, for instance, four different topics. You know what I mean? So I left, on two. Next one, it was all zone one finishes from crosses. Uh, the next time, it was all uh, zone one finishes where balls are played in with, with a back to goal. So mm. every time, every scenario, we created over a period of time. And that was sort of the two things. So it was like where the mind goes, eh? bringing from away and to understanding, and then it's putting it into practice. Yeah, practice makes perfect, and yep. practice makes permanent, mm -hmm. as we all know. <laughs> Repetition. So with Anthony, what Anthony at the moment stops him from being, the problem is probably his own personality. Yeah, he's a fiery lad. You know, he's always, he's a bit this Very and that. Very confident. 
Yeah, confident. Seems like he's confident. Yeah, he is. Yeah. He's probably. He, he, I, I'm not saying he's not confident, but he, at the same time, you can also be a little bit overconfident. The, the, in those positions, because to make him more productive at the moment in his positions, it's pr mainly based all on his left foot and it's whether a finish, yeah? Mm. Not often a cross. So you basically don't really get much for that because you will then transfer the ball and there's nothing going on the outside. Yeah. Not not a problem because then you need players making overlap runs and then you need to make sure that they have the quality to do it. Mm. But it would help if you could also go on the outside. Yeah. You know what I mean? You know, that's always that's always, you know, the most important thing. And predictability. Yeah, exactly. That's it. You know, and you get that unpredictability for going inside or outside, but also if you can create those, you know, um, you know, two V one situations. Mm. But I think he needs to yeah, how do you say it? He he tends to, he comes across to me that he gets irritated very quickly. You know what I mean? Mm. And uh, and and be, and that can transfer in a lot of negativity at times. And you don't you don't want that. You want him to be positive. You want him to be, you know, you know, good on the ball and 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 and, and find ways if it doesn't go for you. Mm. Can I play in, for instance, in different positions? Can I come and play more in the pocket and open this space up? You know what I mean? Rather than just stick on the line because. If they stick on a line and you get one defender and another one covers it, basically, you know, okay, just yeah. Then the only thing, the only option is left, passing it to somebody else, and that's not where strength is. Mm. You know, learning him, teaching him to make late box runs when the ball is on the opposite side, to making sure he can score goals at the back post. You know, at times he's too passive. You know what I mean? Because the only goals he wants to score on left foot and, and ping it in this corner. Yeah, you, you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. So sometimes you need a little bit more, but he's obviously a great, great talent. And Eric's worked with him, mm. you know, for a long time at Ajax. So it shouldn't, it shouldn't be an issue, in my opinion. This brings me to um, um, what kind of work did you do with the players when it came to the mental aspects of the game? Because you're, you're speaking about his head being too. To all the players. Yeah. What kind of work did you do at the training ground to to work on the mental aspects? Did you do anything? No, uh, yeah, well, <clears throat> sometimes when you work sometimes with, with individuals and, and, and players are all different. Some are very strong characters. Some need a little bit more support, this and that and the other. But the mental side is like I said, when I, when I talked about all the sessions had a purpose and a challenge, mm. the challenge a lot of times was mental. You know what I mean? People always talk about, for instance, an example, everybody talk about Fergie time. But we did we did a lot of scenario football. Mm. You know, what I, what I try to say with that is that Okay, guys, this is it. You guys, you're holding on. You know, you're two one up. You know, uh, semi final Champions League. You know, whatever. They need to score to equalize. There you go. Right. You guys also got a man stand off. So okay, what do we tactically do? You know, to make it sure. Mm. So those sort of yeah. tactical challenges mm. mentally. Uh, as well as, I have to say, do not underestimate the power of the personality of the manager. If I ask you, what when you saw Sir Alex Ferguson in his prime, what what did you see? Desire. Yeah. Passion. Passion, confident, you know, winning, you know, Matt. That transpires to the players. Mm. That was exactly what we had in our players. You know, when I looked at, you know, Rio and, and Vidic, you know, in, in a central defense, you know what I mean? Patrice with his never, never, never ending energy, you know what I mean? And it's striking to see how many leaders that were in that team. Yeah. And it's a good aspect that you bring that up because I think that's also what's lacking a little bit at the moment a real mm. leader. Listen, again, and there's a lot of discussion about it. I love, I love Bruno as a player, I love him to bits because he's, he brought straight away when he came in. He brought that what we were lacking, you know mm. what I mean? That quick transition from back to front, put a little, put a little bit of unpredictability in play, not being afraid to take shots, you know, creating something. But then in the start, he was always playing with a smile on his face. <laughs> now he's always not playing with a smile yeah. on his face, and I think he doesn't, you know, he, he doesn't need that kind of. There's a lot of again, a lot of irritation there at times, and that trans. That transpires, yeah. you know what I mean, and uh, it's a shame we uh, we don't need that. But um, but the thing, Frederick as well at that time, the squad was 
you know, from itself. And like I said, one, they had the strongest leader you could think of. You know what I mean? And we had a lot of, you know, really strong individuals, you know, uh, especially in the beginning, you had still Gary Neville, you had obviously, you know, Skulls gigs. Skulls was just a leader on the ball. He didn't have to no. talk much, but just, you know, you know, so in, in every different ways, you had different kind, mm. different kind of leaders and they would, they would feed each other. They would feed of each other. That was, that was the big strength. You know, if they felt, hold on a minute, we are, let's, let's get this right. They, they would be able to. And uh, like I said, when you come to games, when it was getting into to, to Fergie time, you know, the late winners that we scored against Aston Villa, uh, Sunderland, um, you know, at home, uh, just sort of on the top of my head, City with Michael Owen. It was because the players knew they were entering. He's very... Uh, he fell asleep. <laughs> happy. But the players knew because we practised it. They knew. I always said to them, listen, just think it like that. You got eight, let's say... 10 minutes to go and we really, we really need to put the foot down 10 minutes plus let's say average four minutes extra time that's 14 minutes yeah mm. now if you're really positive you should get at least seven to eight balls in the box mm. seven to eight if you suddenly go a bit more direct and all this with seven yet and and then depending on what we did you know in the terms of the changes that you made so of those chances one of them needs to be in the back of the net or maybe two yeah so if you suddenly go to let's say uh, eight minutes and four minutes extra, it's 12 minutes to go. So suddenly you see five or six balls in the box. That's how you wanted players to think. Four minutes to go plus four minutes extra time is eight minutes, probably three to four balls in the box. Four minutes to go, we're in extra time now. We still should at least get two balls, two balls in the box at least. You know what I mean? Mm. That's, how the, that's what I wanted players to think. So yeah. what it does, again, back to purpose, they were playing that extra minute or the extra time or the last minute with a purpose, mm. you know, and the challenge of we need to score. So if you if you prepare them for that, they don't, you know, they don't they don't panic. It's the same thing just to finish off with prep preparation for penalties. You know, I've I've done it a number of times, but and I've always felt everybody that says now penalties are a lottery and all that crap. Rubbish. You make it a lottery if you don't prepare. The biggest thing is what what situation are is every player in when it gets the penalties? It's high emotional because you just play 120 minutes mm -hmm. and there's no outcome. It has to be decided by penalties. Mm -hmm. So what do you want? You want a group that is confident, prepared, relaxed to be ready to go to do those penalties. Mm -hmm. And that's why I always a big advocate. So when we get to tournaments like we did in the World Cup with Australia, I started right in the beginning. We need to start working on practice penalties. People think it's miles away. It is. But remember... It gets there fairly, fairly quickly. Mm -hmm. So every time you yeah. see those penalties, we were always ready. I've always had a list in terms of, okay, what would the list look like if all the best players, penalty takers are still on the pitch? Easy, one to five, yeah, six to 10. Or if we start making substitutions, which are the ones? Be careful that we don't take too many penalty takers out. And who will slot in? Is the order going to change as well? Whatever. So it's all ready. Mm -hmm. Guys, this is what we prepared for, 100 min 120 minutes, 90 minutes plus, extra time, bang, penalties, this is our time, this is the order, and you know the reasons why, just do your thing, just be relaxed, don't, don't get away with a hype or, or missing or somebody else misses, wait, just stay calm, because if the emotions go like this, you know, mm -hmm. the focus goes as well, Yeah, stay calm. Okay. So, is it okay that I finish off with one last yeah, question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks a lot. Um, who made the biggest impression on you during your time at the club? So Alex. Is there any key moments that comes to mind? Every single day? Yeah. 100%. <laughs> he was like, and it comes down to what I said before, how can it be that you work as a first team coach for Manchester United with such a highly talented group, experience, you know, uh, winning, winning, winning year in, year out, and you've got the highest of expectations and you don't feel any pressure. And, Amazing, yeah. and 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 the impression was that he was he was so yeah so good at running the club, managing the people, calm, very good listener, very very good listener. He would just he wouldn't always go and you know we didn't have you know 
you know, I don't know how many, you know, long, long discussions about things, you know, he would say, yeah, I think this, great. If somebody else, me, Mick, whatever, we would say, well, what about this? What about that? He would take it away, listen about, think about it. Yeah. So every, hundred percent, hundred without, without a shadow of doubt. It's, it's enriched me as a person, as a coach. So much has been the highlight of my coaching journey without a shadow of a doubt. Uh, so far, although I have to say that the last experience with Australia at the World Cup was very special as well because you you achieve something um, with a far, you know, in a, let's say a different standard, a different level, but you oh, not overachieve. I think we achieve what we set out to do, but in a different way, but it, it, in, in a World Cup setting, which I, I thought was absolutely fantastic. Hmm. So yeah, uh, very very privileged, very honored to 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 have served with him. Are you still in contact with him? Yep. Yeah. 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 Regularly, we we text each other today actually. Yeah. So uh, yeah, no, good. He's, I met him uh, a month ago. Went to his office to have a cup of cup of coffee with him, and it was just like all days. And mm, if you get him going, you trigger him. Yeah. And the stories that come out, that's just fantastic. Fantastic. Next time, bring him to the podcast as well. <laughs> Yeah, well, <laughs> I'll ask him. <laughs> no problem. But thanks, guys. Uh, thanks a lot, Renee. I hope, uh, I hope that was all good. Yeah, we're we're good. way into to Fergie time now. Thank you so much for your no uh, time, Renee. Enjoy the chocolate. I will do. And we we'll, we'll uh, toy a piece now. <laughs> see how it goes. I'll, t I'll tell you now. Yeah, you have to be honest. Mm. From one to ten. Mm. <laughs> mm. Is that a 10? Yeah, very good. Yeah, fantastic. Mm. Good. Beautiful. We'll go back to Norway, Frederick, and uh, and practice to say Ten Hag yeah. on a daily basis. Thanks so much, uh, Rene, and I'm sure our listeners will enjoy this one. Brilliant. Thank you so much.